The Oklahoma City Thunder are starting their final week of the regular season. Will they be playing basketball next week? We'll talk about that, what the rotation might look like, and so much more coming up on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder Podcast. On the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. I'm your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com. Ryland Styles, you can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. On today's show, brought to you by Game Time, we're going to dive into the Oklahoma City Thunder rotation, previewing the week ahead for OKC and your mail bag questions folks download the game time app by creating an account and using the code locked on nba you get 20 dollars off your first purchase that's last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed check it out today at the game time app and use code locked on nba so the thunder are entering their final week of the regular season and a lot is still to be determined the Thunder right now are pretty much just racing the Mavericks, although things, of course, can get complicated with like a 50 million tie race. But still, for the for the point being, they're racing the Mavericks for that final spot in the play-in tournament. And there's been rumblings of the Mavericks possibly shutting down Luka, shutting down Kyrie. But Luka came out today and said uh, that if there's still a chance to make the postseason, he's not going to stop playing. And so he'll be playing for the Mavericks tomorrow. They finish with three games at home. OKC finishes with uh, three games, two of them on the road tonight against the Warriors in Golden State, uh, against the Jazz coming up this week on Thursday, and then Sunday, home finale against Memphis. The beautiful thing about the Memphis game, even though Memphis is a really good team, uh, there could be a scenario where they have locked into their seeding at two, and there's just no reason for them to play their guys, at least not uh, a full game workload of, of, of uh, reason to play them if they don't, if they play at all. But ultimately, it's going to come down to the Thunder need to get the game against Utah. Like, they have to, have to, have to get the game against Utah. And then, surprising, Golden State or Memphis would be huge for OKC. Uh, For Golden State tonight, they don't have Andrew Wiggins, but they're otherwise healthy. OKC, of course, they don't have their two season-ending injuries in Kenny Hustle and Jet Holmgren, but otherwise, they're healthy. So, it's going to be best on best to see... If the Thunder can go into Chase Center and beat the Warriors, the defending champions who struggle on the road but are really good at home. So, like, they're a really, really, really good uh, home team. This is not going to be an easy task for OKC. A little bit of a break on the start time. Not not 9.30, but it is 9 o'clock. So, a 30-minute reprieve from what the West Coast swings have typically been. On today's show, we're going to talk about your mailbag questions, and we're going to dive into them right now from at Grizzly311. Which bench player do you think has the best chance to pop off in a potential playoff game? I'm going to go with the easy cop-out answer, and that's Isaiah Joe, because Isaiah Joe is going to come off the bench, and what if he has one of those games where he where he nails five threes, six threes? I mean, that changes the entire complexity of a game. And in the play-in tournament, that's huge, because, of course, it's game by game. In the, in the series, that's also big, but like he has the biggest boom chance. Uh, in terms of... Uh, non Isaiah Joe, because I think that's a very easy answer to make. I would also go with another easy answer in Wiggins, is because I, I think that Wiggins will get a bulk share of minutes in the postseason. There's no, you know, there's no reason to not play him 25 plus minutes off the bench in the postseason. And we've seen what a winning Im- impact that he can make from defensively to transition to three point shooting to cutting back door. Like we've seen all that he can do on the floor. And I think that Wiggins is a really good player. So I'd go with Joe. Wiggins, I think that th- that kind of leads us into uh, another question that we're going to talk about later about the rotations in the postseason. But those are my two guys that I would think off the bench have to be good for you. Like you, you have to get a good Isaiah Joe game, you have to get a good Wiggins game, and then you have to, of course, have Shea and J Dub and Giddy uh, play extremely well. And then you know what Ludor can bring you off, uh, you know, defensively and then offensively. Maybe he can knock down a couple threes. From at call me Klop thirty five, what stars could OKC get that would perfectly fit their roster? and could elevate them to the next level. You know, I understand that when you look at where the Thunder are at right now, and they're in the playoffs already, they haven't seen Chet play yet, they have a mountain of draft picks, and 
Um, the, the inevitable question becomes, who should they go all in for? What disgruntled star should they go land? And me personally, I don't feel confident in going out and getting another star, like star star, this offseason because you don't even know what you truly need yet. You haven't seen Chet Holmgren play. You don't know what mistakes he covers up, what mistakes he creates, and and what holes he fills and doesn't fill. So you need to understand how this team plays together before you go get another star. And I do think that there's a real chance that this team develops in a way where they don't need another star. They need another good, high-end role player. And let's say Pascal Siakam, right? Like Pascal Siakam, undoubtedly a really good player. Like really, 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 really good player. What do you fit next to Chet Holmgren? You can you can talk yourself in to that being a, a really good pairing. But that takes a lot of um, forecasting before we've seen Chet Holmgren even play. So that's like an example of like a star who like, obviously if he becomes available this summer, uh, people are going to want to go get. Uh, but then, you, then you're taking into account, okay, we're just hoping that that pairing works versus we haven't seen Chet Holmgren play to know what would work alongside of him. What I would more so be interested in the Thunder doing would be getting... If they want to go make a big move, I think that getting like a high-end guy like Michael Bridges would be phenomenal. I think that I think that getting a guy like Bridges who can knock down threes, we know what he can do defensively, and fits this whole length model, I think that that'd be a great add for OKC. More so than even going out and getting a superstar. Because so I think that Bridges also doesn't complicate things very much. He, he kind of fits seamlessly into what you want to do. And from all like the stuff that you see off the court about Bridges, like he fits right into what OKC's building. Like he's a really funny guy. He does great interviews. You know, he, he's he's hilarious. Like he, he kind of fits the the nature of the beast with what the Thunder are doing. The next question comes from Goggles underscore FTW one, and the question is literally just Sarge question mark. So I don't know which direction you would want me to go on Sarge. Uh, yes, his name is Sarge. If that's your question, number two. Uh, if your question is, why isn't he playing more? I think that he's just in that Muscala world. Where, like Some games Muscala played well and played a lot of minutes. Some games he didn't play minutes at all. Uh, and it's just kind of matchup dependent by and large. And if you're asking about the future of, of Sarge, I think that this has been an up and down roller coaster in the last couple of months where like he burst onto the scene with OKC and people were, were, were clamoring for him to be here for the long term and then had a rough, rough patch and then that kind of got... Uh, Denied, and then now he had a really good game against Phoenix again on Sunday, and and we're kind of back in on Sarge. So, like, ultimately, the initial trade reaction was that Sarge would not be here long term, and then he played well, and and we kind of talked ourselves into it. So, I I would kind of stick with the initial trade reaction, although I think that he has um, he has shown some good things in OKC by and large. But it's hard to answer the question that's just labeled Sarge question mark. So, if you want a more detailed Sarge answer please leave a more detailed question in the DMs. I'll just directly give you all of my Sarge info about Dario Sarge. Uh, at Patriot 19912021, were there any instructions to Mark from Presti about playing to win after his process comments? No. Uh, I, I would highly doubt that. I, I think that everyone in that Thunder organization is on the same page. And everyone in the Thunder organization understands what the plan is for this season and how they got to this point. I don't think that you know Mark you know tightened up the rotations a couple games ago because Sam was like, well, you can't say this publicly, so we've got to tighten up the rotations. It's just part of the plan. Just like on Sunday, he played Sarge, who no one wanted to play a week ago from Sunday. Like he, he's going to play these guys and see who can give them a boost. And sometimes, you know, he only has to go nine, ten guys deep to give him a boost because the, the ninth or tenth guy gave him the boost. And sometimes the, those guys don't step up, so he goes 11 and 12 guys deep. Like, that's just the nature of of coaching in the NBA. Uh, you have another good question here about Pokashevsky and Jeremiah Rumpsnarl, their future on the team. And plus, how many picks would it take to get Scoot Henderson in the draft? We'll talk about all that coming up. But first, I want to say right now, but our good friends over at Game Time, folks. Game Time is incredible. It is an app that you need to go get right now, and you need to use the code Locked On NBA because what Game Time does is it allows you to get great tickets. You can be buying tickets for 
all your favorite, favorite events like playoff games, you know, the Thunder playoff game, maybe they get through the playing tournament and, and get to play playoff basketball again on OKC. Uh, concerts, uh, minor league baseball games, they have the OKC Dodgers on there. They have MLB games. They have anything that you want on there at game time. So you can go buy the tickets that you need uh, at game time. We know it's concert season now as the weather gets warmer. So check out game time and make sure that you are getting what you need. You can always get uh, the best tickets around the best cost around for your last minute tickets by using the code locked on NBA. You get $20 off of your first purchase. That's $20 off your first purchase. Whenever you download the game time app, create your account and use the code locked on NBA. You get $20 off your first purchase terms and conditions apply. And make sure you create your account and redeem the code Locked in NBA for $20 off your first purchase on the Game Time app today. It is last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We're back on Locked On Thunder Podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. So I want to dive into here. The next question from Patriot 1991021. Pokashevsky and Jeremiah Rumpsner, what's their future on the team? The thing is here with these two guys, number one, I think that we do a disservice in some cases to Poku because he looked really good before his injury. Like he looked really good. Like that's undeniable. He truly looked improved. He truly looked better. Um, scoring the basketball, defending better, uh, just overall looked better. And then he had a, a gruesome leg injury that took him a long time to get back on the court, uh, played a couple of G League games, and we expected him to be right back into the peak of his powers, and that's just not how it works. Uh, Jeremiah Robson looked a lot better before his injury as well. So ultimately, I think that these two guys are both going to be in OKC next year, and they're going to get a full offseason to get healthy and, and work back into being 100%. And then from there... It becomes judgment day. Like next year will be a big judgment season for those two guys and their future with the team. I don't think anything will happen with them right now. The thing is, too, you know, the Thunder are in roster crunch. They're going to need roster spots, but they don't need that many. We're going to we're going to be cutting Poku and cutting Jerry. And the thing is, if if you're sitting there going, well, they're not any good. They're not any good. Okay, well then, why would any other team trade for them? Exactly. So they're going to be they're going to be around next year. I think that they're both good players. I think that they both can be good. Uh, and they at times this season were good, and at times this season they've been bad. And it's and and we'll see how much of that is just natural regression versus how much of that is the injury that they both sustained, uh, a, a gnarly injury each. And they have not looked the same since. And they and since the injury, you know, Poku looked good in the G League. Jeremy Armstrong looked good in LA. And we'll see if they can turn this around with one week to go. Uh, how many picks would it take to get Scoot Henderson? I know that people have been down on Scoot in the sense of he's no longer like some people's solidified number two, but I don't think that the Thunder would be able to trade for Scoot Henderson because when trading for draft picks, what the Thunder will be able to do is, let's say that they get the 12th pick, they'll be able to trade from 12 to 8, 12 to 10, 12 to whatever you want to put the number on, 7. But at some point, you, you trade so far up that you no longer can deliver that team you're trading up with their guy. And that's what the problem that they ran into whenever they finished sixth in the lottery, you know, whenever, they, whenever the lottery shook out and they got sixth, where you could no longer deliver the team their guy. That's how these trades go down, like the Luka Trey Young trade. Atlanta wanted Trey Young, Mavs wanted Luka. It, they were in opposite spots to each other. The Mavs threw an additional first and they got their guys and everyone's happy. So OKC can really only deliver the guys from 12 to like seven because at that point it's all jumbled up. And even if your guy somehow gets sniped from you between those two spots, if you, if you swap from say seven to 12, well, you still got a, a great draft haul for the future and you still get a pretty comparable talent. So I think that with this trading from like 12 to two, that in my opinion would be extremely hard to do. And, 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 and probably, outside of the realm of possibility, even if he falls to three. Uh, but I do, I do love Scoot. I loved watching him play uh, those couple of games he was here in OKC. Now, at Deanna Harding six, Hardy 16, what players will be playing in the FIBA World Cup from OKC? I'm really bad at predicting this kind of stuff. I, I don't know who will play. I would assume Dorton Shea will play for Canada. I think that Giddy is a possibility to play with Australia. But it just comes down to if the players want to. And like... 
maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't really know, but like, yeah, I think that I think there's a good chance that Dort and Shea will play for Canada. Giddy will play for Australia. Uh, at Bobcat Sooner, when the season started, how many of us actually predicted this type of season? That's a good question. I, I don't think that many people predicted them to be in this spot when the season started. Because remember, the season would start, you'd have already known that Chet Holmgren was out. You'd have already known that, you know, uh, what the projections were. And with this team, I think that you could have predicted them to be competitive, which I thought that this team would be competitive and just struggle to close out games and, and, and lose more games than they've, than they've lost. Like, I thought they would lose games, but not because they were tanking, not because they didn't want to win, because they wouldn't know how to win. They wouldn't know how to close out these games. And, and, and that's what's typical with young teams. So I thought they'd be competitive and they just lose a lot of games really close. They've won a lot of games uh, close and they've won a lot of games in general, uh, more games than I thought they would win. So I think that that was kind of like a very optimistic look at it. And, and there was also some looks at it like you saw with John Hollinger picking him to win 20 games. So the spectrum was all over the place, but I don't think anyone got him close to like making the play and making the playoffs. Like that had any level of non- Thunder colored glasses on. Like obviously, if you're a fan and you want to be excited about this team, you can talk yourself into any team anywhere making a run at the play in. But like, you know, when you look at this team objectively, I thought that my prediction was pretty optimistic of like, hey, that they're gonna compete, but they're gonna lose games. And they've surpassed even that uh projection. So they've been really good this year. Uh, at OKC Thunder, what players would you prioritize giving important minutes to? I would imagine that this means in the postseason this year. Uh, so I won't. We won't speculate on next year, but the starting five seems pretty set in stone. SGA, Lou Dort, Josh Giddy, J Dub, J Will. Beyond that, you have to go Isaiah Joe and Aaron Wiggins first two off the bench. And then from there, it comes down to what you need in a certain matchup and what you think that the team needs. I I think that you will maybe you know hardly play the 8th, ninth, 10th guy for this specific team. If you need an 8th guy to throw in there, it looks like it's going to be Lindy Waters for what they've done to this point in terms of their pattern. But I would see like Lindy, Man, Jerry, Poku, whoever you want to throw in there, I'd see that all those guys play like 10 or less minutes. And then it's the 7 guys that play 20 plus minutes each. To where, uh, yeah, technically they do get in the game, but they're just not at, a, at an extremely high clip of minutes. But it's really going to come down to, if the Thunder win games next week, if they play games next week, it'll come down to how Isaiah Joe and Wiggins do off the bench, and then can you get a good game from J-Dub, uh, you know, who's a rookie? Can you get a good game from Josh Giddy and Lou Dort? And then we know what, we know what Shea can provide. So that's what it is. It's those seven guys that are, that are going to carry you to the promised land. And, and and ranking these players gets a lot more interesting as you had Chet Holmgren back, as you see what moves that they make this summer, and we'll do this again. Uh, this summer. We'll, we'll rank the entire roster before the offseason kicks off, so before the draft, and then after free agency ends, we'll do it again. And after summer league, we'll do it again. And then before the season, we'll do it again. We're five days a week throughout the whole offseason, so we had a lot of time to talk about all these future endeavors. Uh, another question is from the same person. Is the is there a point in time where, where Sam Presti will trade everyone besides about seven guys to get a great eighth player to have a great playoff rotation? This kind of goes back to the other you know, question about Jerry and Poku. If the Thunder are at a point where they can have seven players who they're going to keep and then have, say, three or four more who are good enough to trade, who are good enough to combine for like an eighth extremely good, great playoff player that's worth sacrificing that depth for, then they would be a historically great team drafting-wise. They'd be a historically great team asset accumulation-wise. So like... I would say no to this question because that would be uh, you know unprecedented. If you have a team that has like 10, 11 guys who can play in the playoffs, who are worth combining into one package to get a great player instead of just having good players, then you, you've, you've, at that point, had an unreal run of drafting talent that we've never seen before. And you're not going to be able to trade guys who are less than that to get a great player for your playoff rotation. Uh, so I would say no. And also, I think that the beauty of this team is is the idea that with these draft picks, you can get cheap, controllable depth for many, many years to come. While you supplement that with your your max guys, like we like you know Shea's a max guy. We hope that 
Dub and Giddy and Chet and all them become max guys. And so your your young controllable depth kind of crutches those guys up uh, with their depth pieces where you don't want to kind of compromise that. And the next question, will you will they consider a window before these rookie deals turn into maxes? Do you have to consider that at any point? I think that the CBA stuff really helps OKC. Now, I'm going to have Keith Smith on. Uh, at some point, we're going we're gonna to talk with Keith Smith about um, the CBA and how, how it impacts everyone. But I, I think that the Thunder, just based on what I've been reading about the CBA, I think it truly benefits the Thunder. Like the fact that you no longer get uh, you no longer get capped out at two rookie maxes or two max con, super, super max contracts. Like that really helps OKC. Uh, and I just think that they won't have to make a decision or you should be at least more encouraged that they'll be able to keep all their guys this time around. And we'll see. We'll see how it goes. At Drillis, do you think that Dort's contract is going to hurt OKC down the line? And is it an overpay? No, I, I think that for one thing, OKC, the beauty of compiling all these second round picks and compiling all these first round picks is no contract will hurt you. Like you can never have a contract that will just that will just be devastating to you because you can always have a surplus of picks to attach to this contract to get this contract off your books. But even so, that's just kind of for your peace of mind. But with Lou Dort, the cap's going to keep going up. The, the, the new the new media rights deal is going to going to kick in, and the cap's going to spike with ten percent cap smoothing. But still, it's going to go up, and eventually, the you know fifteen million dollars will look like nothing. It'll look like absolutely nothing to the point where we won't even recognize that Lou Dort is on some some big contract. It's big relative to um, the rest of the Thunder roster. It's big, but in the grand scheme of the NBA, paying a guy fifteen. 16, 17 million dollars won't mean anything in a couple of years, especially for what he brings defensively. And then if you get any improvement at all offensively, then it looks really, really good. But again, because the Thunder have the the get out of jail free card, they can be more more liberal with how they give away money because they can just attach picks to them and move them, move off of them, uh, which is what we've seen be currency in the NBA to this point. Obviously, the new CBA might change things, but uh, it, it is what it is with Lou Dort. And I don't think that this contract was an overpay. I don't think it's going to hurt OKC in anything that they want to do moving forward. I think that we're just kind of jarred by some of the stretches that Lou Dort's gone on in this season. Uh, at K. Mitchie, what player would OKC target next season to add? I, again, we'll do this a lot in the summer. I, I personally just cannot shake the idea of how great it would be to get Michael Bridges, but... That comes down to a lot of different factors, like like how can you acquire them, what what mechanisms you need to use to get them. So we, we'll talk about that later, but like that's kind of the name that I'm stuck on right now with, with who to add. We'll talk more coming up about what the Thunder should do this last week of the season and some ideal playoff matchups for OKC all coming up. But first, I want to say right now, but good friends over at BetterHelp, folks, BetterHelp is here for you. And it's about getting to know yourself, and it's a lifelong process, especially uh, where you're, because in life you're always growing and you're changing, and that's where BetterHelp is here to you. Uh, you can really use this therapy, and it's all dependent on your self-awareness and understanding, because sometimes you don't know what you want or why you react a certain way to, to things that you react to until you talk through them with, with a professional. And BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist that can take you on this journey of self-discovery, from wherever you are, you can use it. It's totally online, and so you can discover the, your potential with BetterHelp. You can visit betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off of your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA uh, to get started. It is awesome to, to use their licensed therapist, and you can always just kind of cycle through these therapists. If you don't if you don't really mesh with a certain one, there's always more on the line to help you until you find that perfect pairing for you. And you can talk through everything and, and just really have an overall better help uh, uh, of your life's journey. So go check it out today, betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Now, make sure that you go check out the Lockdown Game to Game podcast for a nightly recap show of everything that happened that before in the association. So check it out today. Uh, this next question comes from at Monard1010. Isn't it smarter to lose the rest of the games and stay out of the playoffs? Uh, no, I don't think that that's the case because one, you're too far deep to even make a dent into like chasing down great lottery odds. But two, uh, the Thunder are in a position where, yes, 
they're not going to be able to get, you know, Victor Mignogna unless something crazy happens in the lottery if they were to lose the play-in tournament. But, like, you saw last year, the Clippers made the play-in tournament. They got the 12th overall pick because they lost the play-in tournament. And that 12th overall pick became J-Dub, who's a really, really good player. And the Thunder in this draft class, because the names are so jumbled up, they're going to be able to trade up from 12 if they really want to, if they really, really want to. Just as last year, they didn't trade up from 12. They traded back into the lottery at 11. Like just out of thin air, they traded up to 11 to get Usman Chang. So it, it, they have the currency to go up to 7, 8, 9, which is, which is where this team, uh, you know, which is where this team would have been whenever you factor in when fans started calling for a tank. They could have only gotten to like an you know, 8 or whatever. And, and that's kind of where... Um, things leveled off that in the process of that you get playoff experience which i think is important and i think is kind of uh a nice reward like it's kind of a nice um no matter how it shakes out no matter if you believe in in what experience does for you even if it's just one game it's just a nice little kind of feather in the cap of what this rebuild is to make it to the play-in this soon to have chet holmgren waiting in their wings and you haven't seen the top five picks step on the floor for you yet this entire rebuild a, a top five pick has not stepped on the floor for okc so uh, no, it, it would be silly to lose out on purpose these last few weeks to get a, a slightly better chance at the number one overall pick. Uh, at AEC18-00, uh, can I send you fan mail? Uh, I don't have a P.O. box, so I'm going to say no on this one. I don't need any fan mail, but I appreciate the effort. You can you can DM me um, anything that you want, to, want, me, want me to see. Uh, but if I get a P.O. box set up, if, if people truly want to send me fan mail, I appreciate it, and I will set up a P.O. box. But so far... Uh, you're the only you're the only uh, one to offer fan mail, and so uh, if I set up a PO box, I will be the, you'll be the first one to know if I do. Uh, but again, I don't need anything. I don't need anything from you. But if you want to show me something really cool, you can just DM it to me uh, on Twitter uh, at Ryland or Styles at It's Inferno. How do you come up with your phrases such as "put the pumpkin in the patch"? <laughs> um, I, I don't I don't really know how it happens. It just happens. Uh, I, I think that like. I'll just be thinking of something like how people call uh, a basketball a pumpkin. And I'll be thinking about how people say, put it in the hoop. And then where you put a pumpkin, you put it in a patch and off we go. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's just kind of how it goes. I'd like to have a little fun with it. I like, to, I like to have fun with some tweets and try to see who I can catch off guard with, with some of my sayings on there. But uh, that that's kind of the way it is for, for my brain. It's a weird brain. I'm glad you're interested in it, but uh, yeah, put the pumpkin in the patch uh, is what I hope that the thunder can do a lot of uh, tonight. At Thunder Buddy 200, what is your ideal playoff matchup and what's the most likely scenario? So I'm going to take this with the first step being the play-in tournament. I actually do think that the Timberwolves of the teams that are in the play-in are the most um, ideal. Not to say that they're the most beatable or, or, or like that they, that they are beatable for sure. Like it's not like a guaranteed win, but like the Thunder have struggled mightily against a healthy Pelicans team. Uh, LeBron, AD, and the Lakers, assuming that LeBron's back for the for the play-in would not be um, entertaining. Would not be uh, it'd be entertaining, but would not be uh, ideal. And if you go into a, a play-in series against Minnesota, where you're going to play a one-off game, right? One one game where it takes all in Minnesota. Would you rather bet against LeBron and bet against AD? Would you rather bet against Bi and Zion and a team that's giving you some trouble this year, or would you rather bet against Minnesota, who at any point uh, could just have some dysfunction with this awkward? Too big lineup that hasn't really worked for them yet this year. Rudy Gobert, we've seen him be terrible in the playoffs, and then it just comes down to Ant versus SGA, and I think that Ant's a great player, and that SGA is better, and so you'd have the best player on the floor in that series. It was, I call it a series; it's a one-game thing. But like you have the best player in the, on the floor, and then you have to navigate those bigs. But hey, every every one of these teams have bigs in, in, in this play-in tournament, which is what is going to be hard for you to navigate. So who has the less less uh, perimeter beaters for the spray out threes. I think that Minnesota is probably the best bet for that one game sample size, but of course it's going to be tough no matter who you play. And then at Kevin Vo Voodoo, is there a specific role Sam Presti is going to make sure he comes away with in the draft or is it just best player available versus specific player type? I'm not going to be able to speak for Sam Presti by any means. I'm, I, I'm not going to pretend to know his master plan and, and act like I'm some wizard of Oz behind the curtain, but I, me personally, I would look at guys like Grady Dick and like guys who who can do a lot, who can primarily shoot, but also can do a lot off of shooting uh, with ball movement and, and and being able to to dive for loose ball stuff that Grady Dick does. You know, I would look for that shooting aspect to be at the forefront of a player's archetype and then work backwards from there. But that's just what I would envision 
for what this Thunder team needs and, and, and how great it could be to have more guys to spray the ball out to. As we've seen what, what Isaiah Joe can bring as a shooter to this team. So uh, that's kind of what I would be looking at in the draft. I could be totally wrong, and we'll have plenty of time to discuss the draft. Again, we're going to stay five days a week after the season's over, so make sure you subscribe right now on YouTube, on podcasting platforms everywhere to uh, to stay hip to what's happening with the Locked On Thunder podcast. And follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. And until tomorrow, we will see you then. Be good and be good to one another.